What's going on, all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Near Mint Condition, the home of Collected Editions. And it is finally here. Part one of the Transformer Comics reading order and where to find them in Collected Editions. So, join me. All right. Before getting started, I do want to give a huge thank you to our patrons for voting for the Transformers Comics reading order. I do a poll on our Patreon to see which comic reading order people want me to work on next, and they have at it. So this time around, I'm focusing on two of my favorite things, comic books and Transformers. I'm going to be talking about the history. So this is going to be a little bit different than most of my reading orders, because I am going to be talking about the history of the Transformer comics and how it all got started, just because I've gotten to know so many of the creators behind the scenes and how all of this came to be. Uh, just through the years, and there's a rich history of it. But of course, talk about the stories and show off the artwork and where to find the stories. As of this video, I don't know who owns the rights to the Transformers comics yet. Yes, there are rumors, but I can't say anything on the channel until there is solid proof or a statement from the publisher. So this reading order will be split up into three different parts. Part one being the Marvel year, so from 1984 to 1992. Part two will be the odds and ends, things that aren't really in continuity, whether it's Marvel or IDW. And part three will be the IDW phases. So let's go ahead and get started. But before I do, if you want written documentation of all this and all my reading orders, that is on our Patreon. If you want to check that and join our Patreon, there is a link in the description of the video to our patron and thank you so much again to our patrons all right let's get started with this minties transform and roll out been wanting to say that for so long all right we're starting this a little bit different because i'm going to talk about how to collect them first there are different options first being of course getting the single issues but this is the home of collected editions why would you want to do that I mean, I do still have most of my single issues. Maybe that's why. Nostalgia. The second way are these Titan hardcovers and softcovers. Titan books have been printing Transformers for a long time. And in the late 90s and early aughts, they started doing them in chronological order. About four to five issues in each of these. These can be found in the secondary market at a pretty decent price, honestly. And due to licensing... The earlier printings of these have the Spider-Man and Circuit Breaker appearances, if you're worried about those, which I'll talk about here in a little bit about the licensing and how much of a nightmare that was. There's also the Hachette line, which is so beautiful. All the spines connect. I have so many of my viewers that have these, and thank you all so much, like Peter and Hayden that sent pictures my way, because, oh my gosh, this is the way that I would love to own them. However, they're not in the best reading orders. They put Dreamwave in between Marvel, Marvel UK in between IDW. It's a mess, and I don't recommend reading them that way. Collecting them? Heck yeah, they're beautiful together. Absolutely. And they don't have to worry about licenses over there, too. There are issues that have characters like Spider-Man. So licenses, what the heck am I talking about? Well, I am talking about a toy license that Marvel published. So, let's talk about this first. Before getting this open and looking at the stories and artwork, there are two different ways to collect these. Uh, three, really, because there was an omnibus that has been discontinued now from IDW, and there were rumors of hardcovers, but this is the best way to collect them in full. We had these previously. These are the classic Transformers. So, when people ask me what the differences are, this here contains all of the issues and characters including the marvel characters there was a deal that they worked out probably because of new avengers transformers which i won't get to until the transformers phase one of the idw years but this what they did was leave out for example issue number three prisoner of war they couldn't even print spider-man on the cover so spider-man does appear this also leaves out the character of Circuit Breaker, and I'll talk about the history of why she's left out if she was created in the Transformers comic, but she's blacked out in every appearance, there's no mention of S.H.I.E.L.D., whereas these have everything. Now, there were only 
six of those trade paperbacks, these old school ones that left things out. And they are cheaper to find in the secondary market because they do leave out stories or leave out characters. They black out characters. These are a little bit harder to find and a little more expensive. So before even cracking this open, I do want to warn people, but people still wanted me to do this reading order because they might find it out in the wild. And I love that feeling. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. We're going to be looking at the IDW books. Yes, I realize there's a volume eight and I am going to be talking about it. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, let's crack this open. The history of how all of this got started. By the way, I love these books because there is a historical value to them. Uh, there are introductions here by Mark Belomo, who actually writes a lot of the editorial notes through here. And I love that because it's a historical view on the Transformer comics. Notice here, number one in a four-issue limited series. So Hasbro, in 1981, approached Marvel to kick off their G.I. Joe comic line to coincide with the release of the G.I. Joe toys. And it was such a huge hit that they wanted to redo it again. Keep in mind, there was no Transformers comic. It's funny how G.I. Joe and Transformers are connected because without the G.I. Joe relaunch, there would not have been a toy line in Japan. Japan. And without that Microman toy line in Japan, we would not have inspiration for Transformers here. So it's funny how they're all connected. So yes, in 1983, they approached Marvel again. And Jim Shooter was editor-in-chief at the time, and Jim Shooter approached Dennis O'Neill. Dennis O'Neill apparently wrote a couple things, and it was just not his thing. So they kept just a couple of things from Dennis O'Neill's uh, little script that he wrote. But they needed a pitch by Monday, and it was the week before Thanksgiving weekend. So it was... They had Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to come up with concept, including names and tech specs. So Jim Shooter came up with a few ideas. He has a two pages written. When I got to interview him a few years ago, we actually talked about this behind the scenes. But he had a couple pages written, and he pretty much came up with the names Cybertron, Autobots, Decepticons, they were at war, they came to Earth, and the name Optimus Prime, and I believe Prowl. Now... He could not find a writer to come up with names and tech specs because nobody wants to work on the weekend. And he finally approached Bob Budiansky and Bob Budiansky was like, yeah, sure, I'll take it. And this is the gentleman that forever changed toys and comics and movies and animated shows. Pretty much our childhood because he created the characters of Megatron, the names, I'm sorry, the names of Megatron, Starscream, all the Decepticons, Blaster and he was just having a ball. Now, for some reason, they made him editor of the four-issue miniseries that came out in 1984. And I love this, by the way. I love that Ratchet and Ironhide are <laughs> the looks of the toys because that's all they were given. As a matter of fact, Frank Springer was just given a little bit of the toys to look at, photos of the toys. Some of them were unfinished. Some of them were prototypes. So he kind of had to finish it off on himself. But that's what kicked off the Transformers. This idea that if it worked for G.I. Joe, we can make it work for these giant robots. There was no plot. There were no names. There was not a cartoon. This is how we were going to do it. And it kicked off this four-issue miniseries where we are introduced to these characters. Uh, this collects the first 13 issues, which I mentioned before includes the reprint of issue number three. Let's actually get to that. Even with the full color cover. There's an editor note right there, and there's Spidey. So this is why I own them this way. I have to have it complete, because that's the way that I remember it. But yes, they wanted to put the Transformers in the Marvel Universe, kind of like what they did with Rom and Micronauts and Godzilla and G.I. Joe. Of course, that only stuck around for a while. Now, we do get to meet human characters here, like Buster Wh uh, Wiki and his dad, Sparkplugs. So a little bit of difference there between Spike and... Buster. Remember when I mentioned S.H.I.E.L.D.? They're in here. But eventually, like I said, they kind of go away and they don't really talk about Marvel characters ever again. But there's another interesting character that Bob Budiansky uh, created, but I'll talk about that here in a second because we need to talk about the four-issue limited series. So issue number four was supposed to wrap it up. 
And even without tax specs, I'm sorry, with with like just unfinished almost artwork, and we had three different writers on the book. We had Jim Salakrap, uh, Salakrap actually wrapping it up. We had Ralph Macchio writing it, and we had Bill Mantlo doing the plot. And even with four different, because uh, of course you also had Jim Shooter oversee the project and Bob Budiansky be the editor, it was a mess. And even with all of these people working together, this book still sold out like crazy. So these were coming out every couple of months. Finally, in 1984, at the end of 1984, they decided to greenlight the ongoing series. So it has my favorite cover, or one of my favorite covers. I love this cover. That right there. So it came back in 1985. This time around, they gave the writings to, actually, Bob Budiansky. And he introduced us to a whole bunch of different characters, uh, originally to the comic book, and then later on you'll see them appear everywhere else. But it's really cool to see that. There's a really interesting character that appears through here, and that is the character of Circuit Breaker. Now, you notice that in the previous collections from IDW of the Marvel stuff, Circuit Breaker was actually blacked out. Whereas here you get... Let me get to it, actually. And it's also important to note the paper quality. So the paper quality in this is this thick matte paper, Whereas the previous printings has had glossy paper. So here she is in her full appearance. She's neither for the Autobots nor for the Decepticons. Uh, you also have the introductions of the Dinobots in here, the Constructicons, and Jetfire was introduced here, even though I do appreciate his cartoon origin more. So again, unlike other classic reprints, there are no missing issues here. And IDW and Marvel sorted out their licensing quibbles so that characters like Spider-Man and S.H.I.E.L.D. and Circuit Breaker are no longer uh, missing from these reprints in this particular collection. Now, we are going to keep going because, my goodness, I just talked about the history of this. I don't know if I'm boring you all, but we are going to be talking about the story here in a second. All right. So, open the thing. This is volume two. Each one of these, by the way as an introduction by Mark Bayomo. And by now we have Don Perlin. That's right, Don Perlin coming in and drawing this. He was uh, famous for Ghost Rider, and he got to draw most of the stuff in here. Later on, we'll have other artists join in. Now, he wasn't really known as a superstar artist, but I thought he did a really good job with these characters. And, yes, let's talk about the stories. So the stories are very similar to that of the cartoon. It seems like it was always a little bit more mature than the cartoon was. Uh, there were deaths in here that didn't happen in the cartoon. Just like characters here were a lot different. He gave the spotlight to characters like Skids. Blaster becomes a huge character. Ratchet becomes a big player in this. Shockwave kind of takes the role of Starscream or Star, uh, Starscream in the cartoon no matter what incarnation always seems to want to take over the Decepticon leadership this role is kind of given to Shockwave who's like a scientist who's a really dark character and I like that I like that these lesser known characters like Skids were given a spotlight Blaster Goldbug later on uh, I have to talk about Goldbug in a little while so in this very volume we have the first appearance of characters like Perceptor we have the Insecticons making an appearance in here um, Blaster uh, we have an original character, Straxus, makes an appearance in here. That's another thing, too, that I mentioned a little bit earlier. There were some characters that only made appearances in the comic books, and later on we ended up getting toys of them, and later on they became huge characters. Uh, there's Straxus, which they did make a... I think it was a Classics toy. Oh, yes, I do collect the toys because I love them. I think it all comes from my childhood, just watching the cartoon, and then when we moved to America, I found out about the comic, and... Back then, the comics were so cheap because, I don't know, I, I don't think they sold, well, maybe it was the late 80s, so the hype had already died down. I remember finding a bunch of them at a yard sale for like 10 cents each, and I made a deal with the lady that was selling them, or probably her kids' collections. Uh, we get to introduce to the aerial bots. Oh, love that. Now, of course, the thing that is missing from the reprint is the Marvel celebration right there of all the Marvel characters which you've seen like on covers to Uncanny X-Men 211. And 
We also have a really interesting thing that happens here that I haven't talked about in the differences. Is that we have the characters of Laserbeak and Buzzsaw and Ravage. They actually talk, and Ratbat, who plays a big important part in the, I believe in the next volume. They can talk, as opposed to only speak in animal noises. And I never understood that, because in the cartoon, they couldn't. But their tech specs have quotes. So... I think we all made our own fanfic or canon that, oh yeah, they were regular Transformers at one time. And then they got turned into animals. Now, I, I will say there's also a difference, not just in Buster and Sparkplug, but there's also Buster Witwicky and Jesse through here instead of Spike and Carly, even though I had the biggest crush on Carly when I was growing up. Now, I am going to tell you to stop here and read G.I. Joe Transformers 1 through 4, because I feel like something is going to change. And that can be found in the Transformers Classics Volume 8, which I cannot find. I don't know where my copy is, but luckily for me, a few years back, I found some custom books on eBay of the Transformers comics. Big, thick books. Now, I didn't say this is a place where you can go and read them because, well, they're custom books. They're not available for sale anywhere, until unless you get lucky on eBay or Reddit or Facebook groups, but uh, this is very important because they wanted to go ahead and start putting both properties together, that they exist in the same universe. And since Marvel was publishing both G.I. Joe by Larry Hama, by the way, one day I can't wait to talk about that, and Transformers by Bob Budiansky, well, what better place for them to meet than a crossover event? This was a four-issue miniseries, and I suggest reading it here because it changes the characters of, well, one character in particular, and I won't ruin the other one, but definitely the character of Bumblebee. He changes through here. He actually changes into a brand new character named Goldbug. So in volume three, you're going to see Goldbug. And if you had not read this, well, then you would be confused because what, where did, what happened to Bumblebee? Where, who is this Goldbug guy? So that's what we're going to talk about. Volume 3. Oh, the irony of putting Bumblebee on the cover after I said he just went through some changes in the G.I. Joe versus Transformers book. Now comes the part of the overview, I'm sorry, the reading orders where I talk more about some of the stories collected in here. Because I kind of gave you the basic premise of what this is. And I am going to be talking about the Marvel UK stuff, of course. Now some people are probably wondering, why am I not throwing in Marvel UK books in here? Because that will be a headache, believe me. I did that reading order once and it just, it was hard. Because sometimes you don't know when the issues fit into the US. So yes, it, it, did this spin off into a Marvel UK comic, which sadly did not get finished um, being collected by IDW. So here I'm going to talk about King of the Hill. Because King of the Hill is one of my favorite stories in here. As a kid, I liked it because it was so different than the cartoon. The Dinobots are a lot different here than they are in the cartoon version. They're a lot smarter. So after beating the crap out of Trypticon, the Dinobots come back and Grimlock takes over the leadership of the Autobots. Now he doesn't turn out to be a very good leader because he's more of a tyrannical leader. And later on in a story called Mechanical Difficulties, Grimlock, uh, has people that kind of leave him like Goldbug and Blaster are just like, man, we can't put up with you, dude. We're gone. So they leave. And of course, like I mentioned, some of you reading this for the first time, you got to read that Transformers G.I. Joe comic to find out about Goldbug. Now, Bob Budiansky kept up with this book for a long time. However, just like any other comic, we get the car wash of doom. That's right. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But man, there are some interesting stories through here that could have been honestly a tv episode like transformers go to hollywood so in here in issues 33 and 34 right here you're gonna see a significant difference in the art style you see the uk flag there so because of editorial mandate and just keeping up with schedules they had to reprint something for the first time which ironically is how the Marvel UK magazine started with reprints. But this time around, they borrowed from across the seas from these two stories, or there were a series of four stories, sorry, Man of Iron that appear in the Marvel UK comic that you'll see reprinted in the classic UK line. And they made them into issues 33 and 34. 
So that is really cool because I had no idea about any of that. I didn't know there was a UK comic at the time. We didn't get it here. And reading those, I was reading it for the first time. And honestly, that's where I taught that's where I have a difficult time. Like, when do these stories fit in? And like I said, I've done a reading order of mixing the two together, and sometimes it's a good reading experience, and other times it just can be a headache. So it is really cool that those are in here. So whenever you get to the Marvel UK books, you don't have to reread them, but the art looks a little bit bigger here too, because I think they blew up the artwork. Now, where do I go from here? Well, I'm going to suggest jumping all the way to Volume 7. Why? Because this is where the Headmasters are collected, the four-issue miniseries. And the hard part about coming here is this is where the last of the issues, 77 through 80, are collected of Transformers. So you have to be really careful. But we do get a table of contents here that tells you where to go. So you go to page 98. Now be careful, uh, because on page 98, you might see the last page of issue number 80 of Transformers. This time around, not so much. But this is what I wish the new publisher will do, is actually put a little bit of thought into how these are reprinted. Putting these where they belong. Because this introduces us to characters like Fortress Maximus and the Headmasters, Scorponok. You get to see a whole new characters that just appear in these single issues. But they are introduced in this miniseries, and that's why I suggest coming here before jumping to Volume 4. Now, during this time, Grimlock and Ratbat are leaders of Grimlock the Autobots, Ratbat the Decepticon, Ratbat, that's right, the little cassette, who later on, in, ironically enough, plays a huge part in the Transformers IDW faces. So this book kicks off with Fortress Maximus and his group of Autobots, which later get involved with Grimlock's Autobots in the arc. Uh, we also have the return of Optimus Prime. I didn't even talk about what happened to him in previous volumes. All I will say is video games. For anybody that has read those issues, you know what I'm talking about. During these reading orders, I don't like to spoil things for people. Um, you know, if it's something big that I can't help that featured on the cover, then yes, of course, I'll talk a little bit about it. But video games, Optimus Prime and Megatron... You know what I'm talking about. But Optimus Prime comes back here as a power master. Because keep in mind, they're still trying to sell toys. They're still trying to introduce new characters. Circuit Breaker makes a return here for one issue. Issue number 46, I believe. Yes, this one right here. And then we get <laughs> what is known as either the best or the worst of the Bob Budiansky era. And that is a four-part under base saga it happens in issues 47 48 and 49 and 50 it has a lot of deaths in here so pretty much the story of the under base hey that's the one i have signed by bob budiansky i really like this i know there are people that hate it and i understand why so the under base saga is like a knowledge base it's a big computer in cybertron and one time optimus prime decided to keep it away from megatron we gotta ship it off into space just shoot it out which we've kind of seen other things happen in the IDW phases and in the cartoon with MacGuffins like that. However, Starscream just turns on everybody, and I love that. Maybe that's why I like this. Starscream just turns on everybody to get this power, and he gives him kind of like cosmic powers. He becomes this almost omnipotent being, and he wants to take over not just the um, Cybertronians, but also Earth. Like, he starts destroying cities... Like, Buenos Aires, I remember because I grew up in Peru and South America, and that one was like, oh, that's close to Lima. Uh, and, and other cities around the world. And there are several characters that die through here. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to flip through much of that. Many characters that die through there. And issue number 50 has a huge, big, well, the cover's really interesting, huge, big, shocking moment. And it feels like, I think to some people, I understand why that Bob Budiansky was either running out of ideas or something was going on behind the scenes because he had been writing the book for about four years. I like those issues, but I can see why people hated them. I mean, if your favorite character is dying and getting blasted for absolutely no reason, that is not a play on words. I swear I'm not talking about blaster. Maybe I am. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> then I can see that, you know, getting I remember in the movie, for example, like Wheeljack getting killed off screen really pissed me off. 
So let's go to the next book, volume five. Now we're getting into the last part of Bob Budiansky's era and getting into what will be known as probably the greatest era to Transformers comic readers. And no offense to Bob Budiansky, I respect everything he did, but the game changer that happens with issue number 56, uh, it's just unlike anything I've seen in comics, um, as far as Transformer comics. For, for a licensed comic, it was just so interesting to go from, you know, these type of stories to something a little more mature and, holy crap, I want to say almost horrifying to read because there were just things that made you feel like you were reading something dark about your favorite characters. The Micromasters are introduced. As a matter of fact, that's one of the last things that Bob Budiansky does is introduce us to the Micromasters in issue 54. And yeah, Simon Furman takes over as writer. So after issue 55 right here, the big wrestling issue, Bob Budiansky decides to leave the book and handpicked Simon Furman. Simon Furman coming over from the UK, and I'll talk about those here in a little bit. But here we have issue number 56. We have new evil Decepticons. Characters are introduced here like Thunderwing, Bludgeon, Octopunch. They're all introduced through these pages. Simon Furman also introduced the conflict between Primus and Unicron. There's this idea that Primus is the creation of everything, that he is the god of light, and that's why he needed 12 warriors, 12 light warriors, if you will. That mythology has been carried into just about every incarnation of Transformers. That's Power Master Optimus Prime, that's what he looks like. That is amazing. The main transition in this volume is that the war between Autobots and Decepticons are now shifting into space. So we're not confined to Earth anymore. Yes, we have pretenders. As a matter of fact, that's kind of a loophole onto how so many of the characters come back from the dead. But man, this volume just changed everything. And these issues were so inspiring to me. Um, because like I mentioned, you know, I was found some at a yard sale with my mom. I wasn't even supposed to find comics. I was just supposed to be looking for shoes or a coat. I can't remember. And I guess it was the early 90s. It couldn't have been late 80s because... I was too young for that. Uh, well, yeah, maybe 91, 92. It was before I was in high school. So it was middle school year. So uh, 91, 92. Oh man, we get the character of Nightbeat who is introduced as like a detective, a cop. Again, that idea carried over into the IDW stuff. Now we have the artist of Jeff Sr. doing a lot of the artwork in this particular volume. We also have Jose Delbo doing some of the art, too. He's the one that drew the characters with all the teeth. And I like his style. He gives them eyeballs. It's a lot different than what Jeff Sr. was doing. And, of course, Don Perlin doing most of the Bob Budiansky era. But, yeah, now we shift the focus over to Volume 6 with Blitzwing. What the hell's Blitzwing doing there? All right. The thing that I hated about Volume 5 is that it ended with Matrix Quest. I think issue number 3 or part 3. Yeah, we get Matrix Quest part 4 in here. How do you split up one of the greatest freaking sagas? Oh, and we do get a lot in here. Ah, uh, the arrival of Unicron, the edge of extinction, and all found... Oh, oh, can't even talk pretty one day. All fan down. All fall down or all in here. We also get the introduction of the Neo Knights, which I believe Furman was using in the UK. So Circuit Breaker reappears and joins the Neo Knights to help protect the Earth and fight the Decepticons through here. And this is where Grimlock decides to go rogue uh, to find the cure-all uh, with Nucleon. And yeah, so let's talk a little bit about Circuit Breaker. Why I mentioned earlier in Volume 1 what makes her a big deal. Why is she belongs to Marvel Comics and not Hasbro. Okay, she was a very unique character in the way that she was introduced. So the character of Josie Beller was introduced in issue number five of Transformers, the Marvel run. However, she gains powers in issue number nine, making a full-blown appearance in issue number nine as Circuit Breaker. And she was a genius, hired by the Black Rock Enterprises. She, she was really young, I think she was right out of high school. Uh, whenever she had this responsibility for designing the most advanced oil drilling platforms in the world. But then in the issue, she gets paralyzed 
by the Septicon attack. And she invented this wearable device. And she's able to walk again. And she's able to shoot energy rays out of her, or electricity, I guess. And she disrupts circuitry, and she can fly. So it makes her very, you know, oh my gosh. <laughs> my daughters were like, what's happening? This is when Andrew Wildman takes over the book. And joins Simon Furman for what will be the end of the Transformers comics. All right, where was I? Oh, I was talking about Circuit Breaker. So what happened was that Bob Budiansky wanted her to be a Marvel character because he knew that one day Hasbro could take away the license. And he didn't want the character Circuit Breaker to stay with Hasbro. So what Marvel did was unleash Circuit Breaker in the pages of Secret Wars 2 and then make her first full appearance, or I guess her full-blown appearance, in the pages of Transformers issue number 9. So that was the loophole. That's why you don't see her reprinted in those issues of um, the Transformer classics from IDW, the first printing of them. That's why you don't really see the character anywhere. You don't see her in any of the incarnations of Transformers because she belongs to Marvel. Now, Marvel really hasn't done anything with the character. I think there was an idea in the Transformers UK book to actually spin off the series of the Neo Knights. But that never came to be. There was a character, what was it? Not Josie Beller, but there was a character that was like her in the Shattered Glass series, I want to say. But that is a little bit of the history of her. And then, yes, we get just, I'm not kidding. It is one kick-ass story after another here with Transformers. By the time Andrew Wildman takes over the book... It's non-stop action. You don't want to stop reading. By now, you're going to see familiar faces like Galvatron, Cup, and Hot Rod. All the characters, well, some of the characters from the movies. You're going to see pretenders here. Uh, and you're just going to get over the fact that Scorponok and Fortress Maximus are the size of Optimus Prime. Even though he's a motor master Optimus Prime. So, that was supposed to be the ending. They were only supposed to get all the way to issue 75. And then Marvel approved five more issues. And that's what's collected in Volume 7. Well, actually, 77 through 80 are collected here, so you only get four issues. But these are some of the best. What a way to finish out the series. I feel like Simon Furman was just told, hey, we're canceling Transformers. Get to going. And he's like, all right, then I'm taking a lot of bots with me. And I'm going to show you what the final cover looks like, because I think it's really interesting. So Simon Furman brings this epic run to an end with... Yet another revival of Optimus Prime. And after the Autobots and Decepticons are, of course, united. Why? Because now we have a bigger threat. We have something called Unicron. And of course you can't trust the Decepticons because the Decepticons end up betraying you. All that plays out, by the way, in the previous volume. So Grimlock, however, had the foresight to understand the Decepticons' betrayal. And he had set in motion a backup plan to save the Autobots and go after the Decepticons. I love that. Bludgeon plays a huge role in this. And there we have, again, Circuit Breaker and the Neo Knights. And how can these two characters be existing at the same time? Well, because the movie is different than the comic book. Now, how do I keep talking about this without going into spoilers? I will say that this does have an ending. It leaves a lot open, and I will talk about those in the odds and ends. But it definitely leaves a lot open for more books to be published. But sadly, the sales declined here and in the UK, and both series were cancelled. Now, I do want to show issue number 80. Ratchet again playing a huge part with Megatron. And I just want to show the cover. The amazing number 80 in a four-issue limited series. Yes. Because they were only supposed to be four issues. But they underestimated us. A bunch of Transformer fans that love giant... We weren't even Transformer fans. We didn't know we were going to be. We just love giant robots. And my goodness, nothing was ever the same again. This volume also collects the Headmasters, like I mentioned. And then you get an adaptation of the movie. And even though the movie is not in continuity, we do get the movie adaptation here. Now, there is a Volume 8, and Volume 8, like I mentioned, collects Transformer. I'll pop up the picture again. It's the picture of Ironhide. Collects the Transformers universe, which I have, like I mentioned, in that uh, oversized hardcover I found on eBay, the custom one. 
and all the biographies from Transformers 47 through 49, 56 through 72, and 74 through 79. But it also contains the G.I. Joe and Transformers 1 through 4. And now we move on across the seas. Because... Transformers Classics UK Volume 1. So, the comic was so popular that Marvel UK offices decided to start bringing it over to the UK. And they did it in a series of bi-weekly comics. So, uh, they reprinted the US comic and then sometimes had backup scripts of other comics. Maybe G.I. Joe, which later on, of course, became Action Man or other published works by Marvel. And the series kept selling and selling, so much so that it went weekly. Now, back in the U.S., remember when I said there was a break between issues four and five because it was supposed to be a four-issue limited series, and then Bob Budiansky was given the role of writing the series with issue five, and it became ongoing? There was a little bit of a break, so the answer was to go ahead and hire some people, some wonderful, uh, talented people, to start writing stories that could take place in between issues while they're waiting on more books to be reprinted. So that's why Man of Iron, remember it was reprinted in America. This is the actual, well, not the actual, but this is printed here a little bit different because this came from a magazine size. So the dimensions are different than your standard comic book size. Now, it's really cool because in the UK, since they were coming out weekly, they had the ability to flesh out a lot of these characters. In the US comics, for example, the aerial bots and stunticons are first shown having just been built and been given life by the creation matrix program. Oh, I didn't even talk about the matrix, dang it. That actually started in the comics long before the movie and long before the all spark, which meh, whatever. But in the UK, they were fleshed out even more and showed the two teams being created out of new technology by Shockwave after scanning Buster Wit uh, Wiki while he had the Matrix downloaded into his brain. So it's really cool that these stories are now being shown for the first time. They're all printed in chronological order. A lot of these for the first time I had never read. I didn't even know about these. And we also have writer and lifelong Transformers fan James Roberts. He provides this huge and in-depth like historical perspective in each of these volumes and we also have new artwork by andrew wildman i love these 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 broke my heart because well it ended with volume five so let's go ahead and keep uh, looking at it. this is what the artwork looks like though dimensions are closer to what the magazine size were supposed to be or i'm sorry the pictures are they're not blown up like they were in the u.s reprint here's volume two now while you see some new faces you're going to see a lot of familiar faces here, too. And the U.S. comic was just so strong. It was growing. They were still reprinting issues here, but were able to tell their own stories and using characters that were not used very often in the American comics. Dino Butt Hunt is one story I wanted to talk about in here. So spending four million years buried in a tar pit had degraded the Dinobots' minds to the point where they become violent and uncontrollable, eventually going rogue and putting the human population on Earth at risk. And this forces Optimus Prime to assemble several teams of Autobots in order to locate and capture the Dinobots. That story is so awesome. We also have the story of Victory here. Uh, I think that one comes from an annual, if I'm not mistaken. And they reprinted it for the ongoing UK comic. And it's pretty much the recaptured Dinobots' minds have degraded to the point where each of them is in a catonic state, unable to wake up. And it's like a dream of the Dinobots. Ah, oh, it's so good. And then we have more of the special teams, like the Stunticons and the Protectobots show up. So now you have the Aerial Bots, the Protectobots, the Combaticons, the Stunticons. And they all make big appearances here, whereas in the US comic, they were focusing on other characters. So you could start reading them like as a shared universe. It doesn't contradict what the other is doing. Well, as of now, volume three, these keep getting better and better. And it could be that I never read these as a kid. So I didn't have any nostalgia and I went completely blind. Uh, the extras by James Roberts, my goodness. They just make these worth it. 
Uh, many times when a comic book is reprinted or collected, there aren't really many extras, but this has everything. Oh my gosh, this has everything. Maybe it's missing some of the cover reprints, but these in-depth articles just make it so much easier to enjoy these stories. Oh, and holy crap, I'm not kidding. These books just get better and better. Because now we have arrived at Target 2006. Oh, dude, this... This is the one that broke my heart because when I found out that the series was discontinued in America, the, the reprints, I was like, no, no, these are so good. They have to continue them. But I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. So with volume three, we get Target 2006. Now, remember when I said the movie wasn't canon in the comics? Well, during the events of the Transformer movies, the Decepticons, Galvatron, and Cyclonus, and Scourge travel back to Earth 1986 in order to create a weapon capable of destroying... Unicron. That's their whole purpose. So the appearance of Galvatron and his minions results in the disappearance of Optimus Prime. So on Cybertron 1986, Autobot's resistant leader Zaron dispatches Ultra Magnus to investigate what exactly is going on. And where has Optimus Prime gone? And then we have in the future, Hot Rod, Cup, and Blur traveling to this past to stop Galvatron. This just changed everything. And then this also has Prey. So after the events of Target 2006, and we have a team up between the Autobots and one of their greatest nemesis. I'm not going to spoil who that is. Uh, we do have, of course, the return of Optimus Prime because you can't keep him away from the comics because he does show up in the U.S. comics. And during this time, they were trying to coincide with the U.S. comics. So this shows the return of Optimus Prime, and now he's concerned that his fellow Autobots are incapable of surviving without his leadership. So before he devises a cunning plan to force them to consider how they would continue without him. Now, of course, the plan doesn't work out because the Predacons show up. Oh, I love that team. Predaking, that's one of my favorite, if not my favorite, combiner. So there were a lot of things that were going on here that were not happening in the U.S. comic. I feel like this... Also had like no restrictions. Again, brand new cover by Andrew Wildman. Now we're in volume four. Wanted, Galvatron, dead or alive. And the beauty of this is that it collects everything intact. Although I know there's a Doctor Who comic. I don't think that one could be collected, but it's but that's the story of Death's Head. Death's Head, that's right. So in the story, here's all the articles. I love all this is collected in here before you get to the comic. It was a lot of fun to read this as they were coming out. But I mean, they don't leave anything out, including cover. So in the story of wanted Galvatron that are alive in the future, Rodimus Prime, who's the leader of the Autobots, cannot confirm the destruction of Galvatron. So he hires intergalactic bounty hunter. Yes. Death's head to track him down and destroy him for good. So, first appearance of Rodimus Prime, as Rodimus Prime, of course, and it introduces us to Death's Head. The coolest freelance peacekeeping agent, who, of course, belongs to Marvel Comics, because he has his own ongoing comic and became part, big part of Marvel UK, but he did appear here. Uh, now, he is the size of the Transformers, and how he got small, that's the one that cannot be reprinted. That's the one that I think has the Doctor Who comic. But man, it is such an awesome story. And then we have Fire on High. That's the one where Rodimus and uh, Ultra Magnus and Goldbug, Rekgar and Death's Head, they all team up to try to stop Galvatron from unleashing a weapon that could destroy the Earth. Oh, it's so good. And pretty much there's also, oh gosh, there's also a team up here with the... Action Man, or G.I. Joe, rather. That team is in here. Or the crossover. Action Force, not Action Man, I'm sorry. But that is all intact in here. And there's an awesome story with Cup. Cup story. Ah, oh, telling the origin of the Autobot's oldest warrior. And his first meeting with his friend, Hot Rod and Blur. And one thing I haven't really focused on are the different artists through these books. Uh, you do have Jeff Sr., of course. Uh, you have Will Simpson, you have Dan Reed, and Jeff Anderson supplying a lot of the artwork in here. By the way, it's not just Simon Furman. You also have uh, Ian Rimmer write some of the stuff in here. I always think of Rimmer as Ace Rimmer from, uh, what is it, 
oh my goodness, um, Red Dwarf. Oh, I don't know why I almost said Black Dwarf. All right, and then we get to the final volume of Transformers UK, the trade paperbacks. Uh, all right, so this here has one of the very best UK tales, and that is the story of the legacy of Unicron. So in the legacy of Unicron, we have a story about Unicron's severed head. You know, from the Transformers movie where it's floating around Cybertron. And his severed head crash lands on the planet of Junk. And his mind is still intact. So once on the planet of Junk, Unicron brainwashes the Junkions in order to compel them to build a new body for him so that he might once more destroy planets, of course, starting with Cybertron. So this here actually has the origin of Unicron and the Cybertrons. Uh, we also have the origin of Primus again. Now, we would have had about, I think, three more volumes to complete the set. However, the sales declined in the UK, just like they did here in America. We were introduced to Ninja Turtles. Um, other comic books were just taking over sales. And the strips, that, to in order to save money in the UK, they started reprinting more and more of the American comics and less of the UK original material. And I remember uh, a couple of my viewers, big shout out to them, by the way, uh, Todd and Fred and Will, that, you know, were telling me that over there in the UK that the strips went to black and white strips. And then eventually it became like a Grimlock comic strip that didn't even fit the continuity of Transformers. Because at the time, Simon Furman went over to America and started writing Transformers. And he did try to keep a continuity between the two, but then it just became a nightmare. So even the way that the characters of Grimlock <laughs> and the Dinobots were written on their adventures of as the force of Earth's defense system just didn't fit into the continuity of what the US comics were doing. So then the strips went to black and white. Like I mentioned, the silly one-page strips of Grimlock, and then it just went to straight re reprints. Went all the way to issue 332, which ended in January of 1992. However, Simon Furman did do an epilogue that has never been reprinted uh, outside of some kind of collection in the UK, I think, uh, for the final issue, issue number 80. And that's it. That's where everything ends, as far as the Transformer comics. This... Hey, that's Flame. <laughs> it looks a lot like Rodimus. Um, Impact Earth. Yeah, there's a lot of characters that started here. But that ends the Transformers reading order. Now, join me for part two as I will be talking about the regeneration, the manga, and generation two, and a little bit of the fan club. Um, and other comics that I didn't talk about here. Because I love Transformers and I love the comics, even though it doesn't really continue this stuff. I guess the closest thing would be Regeneration. But for the people that are like, why did I include Regeneration in here? Because that's not really part of the Marvel line. It wasn't like Simon Furman wrote those issues initially after writing issue number 80. They're great, just like Larry Hama's A Real American Hero. And I will be talking about them, but I feel like everything else... Those epilogues or those stories can be completely retconned by whoever the new publisher are. But this really does end the Marvel stuff in Collected Edition. And that, as they say, is that. While I mentioned most of these are out of print, there are plenty of other Transformer comics still in print. And if you want to go and purchase them, check out our sponsors. If you live in Europe and are interested in buying and pre-ordering Omnis, then you should definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices for Marvel and DC books within the EU, flat rate shipping of 12 euro for all EU countries, bulletproof packaging, and all emails will be answered within 24 hours. They offer a huge selection of out-of-print books. Just head over to waltzcomicshop.com for more great deals and rare titles. And for a limited time, you can use the code NEARMINCONDITION, all one word at the checkout, to get free shipping for all EU countries with your first order of over 40 euros. Walt's Comic Shop, your reliable source for Omnis and Premium Collected Editions in Europe. CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. 
And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. And that was it. That was part one of the Transformers Comics Reading Order and Collected Edition. Editions. Let me know in the comments down below how you read these. Do you put the Marvel UK comics in between issues of the US comics? Because that got to be a headache. Uh, how do you have these? Do you have these in the IDW trade paperbacks, the Titan hardcovers or trade paperbacks, the Hachette wonderful connecting spines, but the reading order is a mess. I would love to know how you own these and if you've never read them and hopefully what you think if the new publisher should reprint these classic stories. This was the Uncanny Omar. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to smash that like button on the way out, please. Check out our videos. We put out videos every day. And if you haven't joined us, think about subscribing. Everyone stay healthy and safe out there. Much love.